So if you want to open your Bibles, we're going to continue in our walk through Galatians. We're in Galatians chapter 5, the freedom chapter. We did a two-part sermon on freedom, and today's sermon is the first of a two-part sermon on the Holy Spirit, on the Holy Spirit. One of the most incredible things about the scriptures is just how connected and cohesive everything is. Uh, I, I found a chart, but I, I uh, didn't pull it up this morning because I'll probably show it at some other time. But this chart shows all of the cross-references and connections throughout all of the scriptures with colored lines, and it's just a blur of colored lines. Thousands and thousands of connections throughout the scriptures. And even though it's written by 40 different authors and there's 66 books written over the course of 1,500 years, it's perfectly cohesive, contains no errors, and it is perfectly trustworthy. The believer in Christ can trust God at his word and know his word is true. It's an amazing thing. And in addition to this, the believer in Christ has been given the greatest gift, the Holy Spirit. This passage gives us an overview of the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. And what we'll see in this teaching in Galatians is just how perfectly it dovetails with the teachings of Jesus. It affirms the cohesiveness of the scriptures. So this morning I want to ask three questions about the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit and what does he do? I guess this is four technically. What does it mean to walk by the Spirit? And what is the result of following the Spirit's lead? So let's read this morning's passage, verse 16 of chapter 5. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with one another, so that you do, not do, you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. This is the word of the Lord. The main point of this two-part series of this passage, if you, if you don't get anything else, this is it. Contrary to what the Judaizers and the false teachers that were teaching the Galatians and coming into the church and teaching them falsely, contrary to what they were teaching, which is that additional work and obedience to the law is required for justification, and, uh, justification, the truth is that if we walk by the Spirit and keep in step with the Spirit, we will bear fruit of the Spirit. And against such things, there is no law. We don't produce fruit by our own effort, We bear fruit by abiding in Christ and living by the Spirit. And we'll see that next week. So for this week, who is the Holy Spirit? I felt that it was pretty important for us to understand and be reminded of the work of the Holy Spirit and who he is. So right off the bat, the Holy Spirit is not an it, but rather a person, a person of the Trinity. Um, When I was a kid... And I think many of you might have been the same way. There are many misconceptions about God in general. I remember one time I asked my my mom, Mom, is God really a turtle? And she was like, is God a turtle? Yeah. And I'd been thinking this for several months. Well, what happened was I I misheard eternal. (laughs) God is eternal. And so I went months thinking that God's a turtle. I was like, it's like Discworld, like a giant turtle with a whole, that, that's, a, that's a very esoteric reference. Um, I remember my brother one time asked my mom, Mom, who is round John Virgin? <laughs> and my, my mom was like, what? it was around Christmas time, you know. Oh, round John Virgin. Oh, round John, that's, that's Mary. It's not... Uh, not uh, Robin Hood's sidekick or something. (laughs) Many people have deep misunderstandings about God, but in particular about the Holy Spirit and the role of the Holy Spirit. And 
A lot, a lot of people think that the Holy Spirit is this mystical force. I actually one, one time heard a youth pastor teach that the Holy Spirit is like the force in Star Wars. Like you should trust the force. Try, use your instincts and, and the force will, uh, it will guide you. And if there was a scale, like one being horrible theology, ten being good theology, I would say maybe right at a five would be like Jiminy Cricket. Because at least he's a person and a guide. So that, that kind of makes sense. But still, no, the Holy Spirit is not like either of those things. Not like the force, not like Jiminy Cricket. And if we really want to know what the Holy Spirit is like, the best thing you could do is read the Holy Spirit's autobiography. So that's what we're going to do this morning. We are going to read the scriptures to find out who is the Holy Spirit. I'm just going to run through this briefly because we don't have time to uh, give an exhaustive overview of who the Holy Spirit is. So the first place you can find it is just right there in the first part of your Bible, Genesis 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God, and we see that the Trinity is present because we know in Hebrews, Jesus was there speaking the world into existence with his powerful voice. And God the Father was there as well. God the Holy Spirit was here. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So we see here that the Holy Spirit is omnipotent. That means all-powerful. This shows his power over creation. He wasn't an energy or a force, but rather a person acting it, as God acting in creation. Another aspect of the Holy Spirit is his omnipresence. That means he's all places. He is everywhere. He's in all places. Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, there you are. If I make my bed in the depths, bed in. If I make my bed in the depths, there you are. The Holy Spirit is omnipresent. And the third O, omniscient. That means he knows all things. 1 Corinthians 2 says it like this. There are the things God, these are the things that God has revealed to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? So in this way, we can relate to God. You know your, your inmost self. The Holy Spirit knows his inmost self, God. Who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. So we, we see here that the Holy Spirit is not an it, not a force. The Holy Spirit is he. He's a member of the Trinity. He is a person. So if the Holy Spirit is a person of the Trinity and retains all the attributes of God, just as the Father and the Son do, what does the Holy Spirit do? What is the role of the Holy Spirit? And uh, I, I want to read the passage this morning one more time here in Galatians. So verse 16 of Galatians 5, it says, So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with one another, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under law. This morning's passage gives us a very clear depiction of one of the main roles of the Holy Spirit, and that that is, he leads. This verse here in John 14, um, when Jesus was preparing to go to the cross, he knew that his disciples would really miss him. And so he says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, an advocate, someone who is for you, to help you, to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching." My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home within them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teachings. 
These words you hear are not my own, but they belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while I was still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, that's who the Advocate is, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all these things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Here's what the Holy Spirit does. He leads you by teaching you and reminding you. Teaching you and reminding you. Now, last week, we answered the question, how then shall we live? As Paul left us with the question that we should use our freedom not to indulge in the self, but rather to serve others. And so the answer he gave was simply love. Love. Go and love. Love God and love others. Well, that kind of begs another question. How do we love? So we know how we should live, but, and it's to love, but how should we love? I want you to think for a moment, uh, and I taught about this on, on Easter, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. They were having a hard time understanding everything that was going on. And then this man, cheekily, came along, it was Jesus, and did not reveal himself to them yet. As they were trying to explain something uh, to Jesus, Jesus said, hold on a second. Do you not understand what the scriptures say? And then Jesus went on to give probably the best teaching of the scripture. I wish I could have been there. The best teaching of the scriptures of all time, right there before these two disciples. And then Jesus did one other thing. He opened their eyes to understand it. So he taught them, and he opened their eyes. This is all believers. Everyone needs these two things in order to understand how to follow God. We need to be taught, and we need to have our eyes opened. The first part is the endeavor of every pastor, every teacher, every preacher. We have to put in the work to study the scriptures intently, to, as 2 Timothy has it, to divide the word rightly. It's a massive responsibility to be able to teach the word of God well. But don't you wish that Jesus himself could just, every Sunday, just come here? I, I would love that. I could just sit down. I could just sit down and listen to Jesus teaching. Wouldn't that be incredible if you could sit with Jesus? Don't you wish that could happen? Like, could you please explain why these things happen to me? Could you please explain what this scripture means? Don't you wish Jesus could do that? Well, if the first part of this is the endeavor and job of every pastor, the second part is God's job. You can have a pastor preach the best sermon you've ever heard in your life, but if God is not at work, it will fall on deaf ears. God needs to open the eyes of someone's heart to be able to understand the scriptures. Well, if only Jesus could explain it to us. Or as the woman at the well would say, if only the Messiah were here, he would explain these things to us. Look at this passage. This leads us to our next point. What does it mean to walk by the Spirit? 1 Corinthians 2 says... What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spirit-taught words. This passage gives us the defining attribute of the Spirit. He leads us. When you become a believer in Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit, and He comes into your life. He reigns on your heart, and He becomes your Lord, your Master, your King, your Intercessor. The immense power of a holy God who created the universe dwells in you as a believer. God, the Holy Spirit, is always with you. And the primary function of the Spirit is this, right here, that he will reveal spiritual realities to you. 
Now, if you wish Jesus was here, I have great news for you. He is here. He dwells in you by his spirit. Jesus explained this to his disciples before he went to the cross. He says this, but because I've said these things, and what he's saying is that he must go to the cross, and his disciples, are, they don't understand. What do you mean you must die? What, what are you talking about? Jesus says, because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. This is better. It's better that I leave. This is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the advocate, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And you can almost feel the grief in Jesus' heart as he says this. I still have many things to say to you. It's almost as if Jesus said, would say, I would stay here with you, but it's better that I go. I have so many things I want to teach you. But someone better is coming to you to teach you. I have so many things to say to you, but I cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you in all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and then declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I say that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Do you see what Jesus is saying? He's saying, it's better that I go because then I can give you this incredible gift. My presence in your life all the time. In Jesus' physical body, he could be in one, one place at one time, but with the Spirit, he can be with you always. And he teaches you, he guides you, he leads you, he intercedes for you. He gives you the power to be free from the slavery of sin and the slavery of legalism if you walk by the Spirit. So this brings us to our final point. Well, what happens when we are led by the Spirit? Well, Paul uses this phrase right here, I say, walk by the Spirit. Another other translation says, live by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. To walk by the Spirit means that you are led by the Spirit. Now, think of your life as a journey. And we've heard this analogy many times. Life is a highway. I want to ride it all night long, right? It's a, life is a journey, right? And... You take one step every day, you get one more yard, you take it on faith, you take it to the heart. The waiting is the hardest part. You, you have to take it every single day, and your journey through life, every day that you walk forward, is one step. Life is just one step. If you think about it all at once, it'll fill you with anxiety, fill you with doubt, maybe fill you with grief if you look back at the tragedies that have happened to you in your life, but if you were led by the Spirit and you walk by the Spirit, what does Paul say is the result? He says this. What happens when we're led by the Spirit? Quite simply, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. You will not gratify the desires of the flesh. What does this mean? What are the desires of the flesh? Paul says, oh, don't you know? It's obvious. And he gives us a list here. He says, the acts of, verse 19, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, Jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Have you ever experienced any of the desires of the flesh? This is the struggle of every human being. We need someone to lead us 
not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. And Jesus has done. And he has given us his spirit. So how do we walk by the spirit? Well, think of it this way. Walk beside the spirit. Walk by the spirit. Follow the spirit's lead. Walk every day. How? Well, think about if you're following someone through a crowd. There's like a giant crowd. I remember when I was a kid, we went to a carnival one time, the Cass County Fair. And there's a ton of people, and I was really little. Everybody was twice my size. And I'm having to follow my dad through this crowd. Well, what am I doing? Am I looking around? I sure want to. There's a lot of amazing things to look at, right? But if I start looking around, I'm going to get lost. I have to listen to my dad's voice. I have to watch my dad, maybe watch his footsteps, follow his lead. Now, Jesus taught us so many things. He taught us so many things. And he even said, I want to teach you more. But instead, I'm going to send the Spirit. And just as you have followed me with your footsteps, you are to follow the lead of the Spirit. And he will lead you away from the things that enslave you and kill you. He will lead you away from the desires of the flesh and into true freedom. When Paul says walk by the Spirit, he's saying follow the Spirit's lead, listen to him, and walk beside him. How do we listen to the Spirit? His autobiography. The Holy Spirit inspired all of the 40 authors, all of the 66 books over the course of the 1,500 years that it was written. The Holy Spirit gave inspiration. It's divinely inspired by God for you to hear his voice. And if every day you're making one step, the most simple thing that you can do is to read God's word so that you can hear his voice. And what did Jesus promise his disciples? If you listen to my voice and you are led by the Spirit, the advocate that I will send will help you. And what will he do? He will teach you so that you understand and your eyes are open, and he will remind you of what you have been taught. This is the role of the Spirit. I don't know if you've ever experienced, experienced this before. Many times... I will have my quiet time in the morning, and then later in the day, someone will say something to me and ask me a question that is exactly what I was reading that morning. Or you'll be in conversation with someone, and perhaps you didn't have your quiet time. Uh, perhaps you, did, you haven't studied the scriptures, or, or maybe you haven't been in, in the Word in, in maybe a couple weeks. But for some reason, you're in conversation with someone, and the Holy Spirit within you is like, Romans 6.23. And you're like, uh, and, and you're able to articulate all of the scriptures clearly and from memory. This is what the Spirit does. He prompts your memory and he teaches you so that you can understand what you're reading. Every time I read the scriptures, every time I study the scriptures when I'm writing a sermon, I will discover something new that blows my mind. It's I, I actually never understood the phrase, and against such things there is no law, until last night. And it blew my mind. And I can't wait to preach that next week. We're going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit. And we're probably going to sing a song. <laughs> what is the result of being led by the Spirit? This is the true result of being led by the Spirit. Freedom. Freedom. This is what Paul has been hitting on over and over again. You want to truly be free? Follow the Spirit. He won't lead you into slavery. Your fleshly desires will lead you into slavery. The law will lead you into slavery because of its expectations. But the Spirit, the Spirit will lead you into freedom. True freedom. Freedom from sin and shame and guilt. Freedom from legalism and fleshly desires. The Spirit is truly a wonderful, incredible gift. You know, um, couldn't help but think, of, do you guys know who Sandy Patty is? Okay, so, yeah, 
all of you homeschoolers are like, yeah. So, uh, when I was growing up, I, I grew up in a, a very conservative Baptist church. And Sandy Patty was uh, on our stereo all the time. But there's a song that she sings on her Christmas album, of all things. And, and the chorus goes like this. The Father sent the Son. The Son sent the Spirit. The Spirit gives us life so we can give and give and give. And the gift goes on. That's, that's the chorus. Okay, now, now you sing it. <laughs> this is the gift that God gave to us. The Father sent his Son. The Son sent his Spirit. And he's given you his Spirit so that you can give to others his love. So that they can experience true freedom in Christ. Paul tells us that the result of walking by the Spirit is a life free from the slavery of sin and the expectations of the law. And in next week's passage, he says, against such things, walking by the Spirit, living by the Spirit, there is no law. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this truth that we can walk by the Spirit. That if we walk by the Spirit, if we live by the Spirit, we will bear the fruit of the Spirit and we will be truly free. God, um, just as I'm thinking about this passage, there are so many times where I am listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit, listening to your voice. And my voice is way louder. And I want to do what I want to do, and I want to do it my way. The flesh is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit contrary to the flesh. They are at odds with one another. The flesh leads to death. When we follow our natural inclinations and our desires, we are, like the rest, by nature, objects of your wrath. For all those who are unbelievers, that is what justification looks like. Your wrath. Father, thank you for sending your Son. Jesus, thank you for sending the Spirit. And Spirit, thank you for guiding us, leading us, teaching us. I pray that we would follow you. I pray that we would walk by you pray that we would keep in step. Lord, enlighten our hearts. We want to be like you, Jesus. We want to love like you, sacrificially like you. And the only way we can do that is if we listen to the Spirit and not the clamor of the world or the loudness of our own voice. We need you desperately, Spirit, to guide us. Father, we trust you. Your word is trustworthy. Jesus, you are trustworthy in word and deed. I pray that we would submit to you by way of the Spirit. We love you. Amen.